Welcome to the Rust Belt Rundown, brought to you by Rust Belt Recruiting. This podcast is designed to shine a light on the meaningful work being done in Northeast Ohio and the surrounding region. We will convene manufacturing executives and Northeast Ohio business leaders for candid discussions about their business, regional happenings, industry trends, entrepreneurship, and more. Now, let's get running on the rundown. Okay, welcome everyone to episode eight of the Rust Belt Rundown. I am your host, Paul O'Connor. And on this episode, we are joined by Bashara Addison. She is the Senior Manager of Policy and Strategic Initiatives at Towards Employment. Bashara, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm doing all right. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate. Yeah, we're excited to learn more about you and and your professional journey and background and experience and all that good stuff. And obviously a ton uh, about Towards Employment. But even before that, just kind of want to give you an opportunity to tell everyone how you got to Towards Employment. I know that this is your second stint there. So give us a a breakdown of, um, you know, your professional journey and, and how you got to where you are today. All right, so um, I went to uh, George Washington University in DC for undergrad, uh, but I'm from Shaker Heights, and I did two summer internships with Towards Employment, one in 2009 and one in 2010. I was specifically looking to do some work around reentry. So um, when I, the way I think about reentry is when someone is returning from incarceration back to our community. And um, I, even though I have a political science background, I had an emphasis on criminal justice reform. Um, I did my senior thesis on the impact of incarceration um, on the political power of neighborhoods. So I have a specific passion for reentry. And I just like in 2009, I was home for a summer taking some classes at Tri-C that could transfer over. And um, I was just looking for a place to volunteer and I emailed like every organization that had reentry somewhere on its website. And Jill Rizica, who is the current executive director of Towards Employment, um, was the only, was, she was the only one that got back to me. Wow. And she was just like, well, you can do more than just volunteer. Do you want to intern for me? <laughs> so I had a chance that's, to in- That's <laughs> yes, perfect. I was just like, yes, that's perfect. So I interned for her that summer. And then uh, the following summer, I'd gotten accepted to a fellowship Um, in Boston, but it didn't start until September. And I realized that I had post-graduation plans, but I hadn't accounted for the summer. And she emailed me and said, we actually have some money to pay an intern. Would you come back and intern for us? So I kind of uh, fell into towards employment. And I would say that my professional journey um, is very much informed and shaped by my growth and experience with this organization. So I would say they kind of gave me my start in at the intersection of reentry and policy. I have grown into a workforce development, workforce policy professional, but that actually came, um, that was lagging relative to my um, interest and passion for reentry. Towards Employment actually operates at the intersection of reentry and workforce development. So it's the perfect place for me. But uh, that, yeah, that's how I got started. Awesome. Love it. Um, well, first off, I, I love GW's campus. I love DC. Uh, it's beautiful. But it's so awesome to walk around there. I've had a couple opportunities to go to some basketball games and uh, it's awesome. So envious of that and, and always uh, love visiting DC. But anyway, um, you spent some time engaged with a ton of organizations in Cleveland, including the Social Venture Partners, Cleveland Young Professional Senate, the Cleveland Foundation, the City Club, uh, the Cleveland Leadership Center. I don't know if you have a social life, but this is all amazing stuff. Uh, can you touch upon these experiences and how they played into your career? Sure. And I would say that Um, these experiences are my social life. So uh, with the Cleveland Young Professional Senate, um, I remember it was actually through Towards Employment. Towards Employment is just like it weaved its way into my life where it's just such a significant um, element. But when I was interning for Towards Employment the second time, um, I've also worked for Towards Employment twice. (laughs) This is my second time being like on, you know, paid staff. So yeah, I have like four stints with Towards Employment. (laughs) But uh, Jill um, actually introduced me to two young women, um, one in particular who was really active in the criminal justice reform space um, and actually now leads the Ohio Transformation Fund, which funds criminal justice reform efforts in the state of Ohio. 
Um, so she introduced me to her and then can, um, allowed me to represent the organization as an intern in um, some committee meetings with the County Office of Reentry. They host and support the Greater Cleveland Reentry Leadership Coalition. And that summer, the county was going through a transition to um, elect our first county executive. And uh, there was an initiative to plan candidate forums on reentry. And it was that planning, it was really just four of us, those three individuals that I was working with that summer um, are still some of my best friends to this day. So when I think about my journey, like my social life was also like in part, Jill can take credit for that. <laughs> um, but those individuals were also the founders of the Cleveland Young Professional Senate. Got it. So that's how I got involved with that organization when I moved back to Cleveland after my fellowship in Boston. Got with it. the Cleveland Foundation, that was a function of a relationship that my parents, uh, my dad and my aunt in particular, set up um, kind of informational interviews for me. And I ended up getting connected to someone on the African American Philanthropy Committee of the Cleveland Foundation. I did some volunteer work for them. And then um, eventually in the last couple years, I was actually asked to join the committee. And so it was through that initial like set of informational interviews that my parents had set up for me that I ended up being connected to an organization that I'm still very active with today. Um, with the other groups, you know, I'm very civically engaged, um, obviously, and my friends are too. So, you know, I think of my professional, my civic life as kind of all one and the same because it's all about servant leadership. And there's so many ways to be engaged in servant leadership, whether you're engaged professionally, um, outside of work, um, just in your personal life. So they, for me, they all blend together. And what I've learned in each of those organizations has allowed me to do something different in um, my my career, you know, specific with towards employment. So I've learned a lot and they, I've found that all of the organizations have allowed me to have mutually beneficial relationships um, that cross paths regardless of whether it's like during the workday or outside of my workday. And then I'd highlight one more, um, the social venture partners. Um, I served as a partner and then I was on the board. I ended up doing a graduate fellowship in the last two years so I had to take a step back from a lot of different groups and that was one of them. But it was one of the organizations where I really feel like I learned a lot um, about what it means to embed equity in a philanthropic process. And I was just really pleased and I'm really proud to see how uh, much this organization has grown um, and how the partners have evolved. So that was another one that I just, you know, love my experience there. But the one organization that I've, I've stayed with consistently has been the African American Philanthropy Committee at the Cleveland Foundation. Got it, love it, that's awesome. Um, so in between the two paid stints at Towards Employment, uh, you spent some time at the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Yes. I definitely wanna talk about a ton of things, but I, I've spent the last five years in New York City um, you know, recently a, a Columbus, Ohio resident, but working closely with the New York City Department of Education. And I wanted to get your perspective on what are some of the hardest parts uh, about working within a major city Department of Education? And just to make a distinction, um, I worked for the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. I was in the CEO's office, which is distinct from like a Department of Education. Yeah, I, um, yeah. So I was more just trying, yeah, just referencing my experience, but then yes, sorry, keep going. And I would say there's, there's so many things that make uh, public service challenging and public service when a child is at the end of every decision makes it just so high stakes that I commend all of the folks who commit their lives to being in education. My dad had a 50 year career in education as a teacher and as a principal, wow. um, and actually still volunteers with the Cleveland School District to this day um, in one of their elementary schools. And he's even doing like some of the virtual volunteering. That's great. So it's, it's definitely a labor of love. Um, I would say a couple things that make working in um, a public school district difficult 
one, there's issues all the time and the issues range. You might have an infrastructure issue, so a water main may break. And so you've got to deal with that. Then you have a parent issue. Um, there could be a staffing issue. There could be a political issue. There might be a behavior challenge. There's stuff happening in the central office and there's stuff happening in the over 100 schools that exist are funded and supported by the Cleveland School District. So it, there's something going on every single day in every part of the district. And that's because it's a, it's an organization driven by people. So it's not like, you know, you have staff that are working on a machine and they, you know, clock in, clock out because your core business is happening at the school level and there's over a hundred schools, it's almost impossible not to have a problem. So that's one, there's always something to deal with. So you might have a plan for the day and that plan just gets totally derailed. Yep. Um, the second is family engagement. Um, I think in communities, urban communities where there's voter suppression and disenfranchisement, it's very difficult to engage families um, for a number of reasons. Uh, some, it's just apathy and that's, that's its own problem. But others are, you know, you have parents that work two jobs and so they don't have the privilege of being able to be active parents in the school district. And that's, that's not their fault but it is a problem. Um, I would say another would be around as family engagement specifically is, you know, you often have young parents or parents that had bad experiences in the K-12 systems when they were going through it. And so there's a resistance and a jadedness about the education system. And that's because of their own bad experiences, which as a child, that was to no fault of their own, but now it's playing out generationally. And there's also a lot of family mobility. So families move around the district. You might have kids in more than one elementary school in the same family unit. Hmm. And so that mobility causes disruption in the classroom. Uh, for the teacher be, to be able to like catch a student up and support every child mm -hmm. and also disruption for the child because they're in, they might have, be in one more than one school in the school year. Got and it. so that I think is a real challenge. And then I would add the influence of politics and non-educators who get involved with the school district. Um, even though we, we can talk about, you know, change management and the need for talent development at all levels of any school district, but the folks who are in leadership actually have, and I'm specifically thinking of Cleveland, uh, really do know what they're doing because they had been educators in the past or have a lot of experience in the issue area that they're in. And, we let outside actors who don't actually have that relevant experience to influence the decision making. And I find that it creates bottlenecks and sometimes holds the work back. It is the work though, because when you're dealing with public funding and issues that impact, so like, you know, being able to have a talent pipeline from the school district means that whoever is coming out is going to impact another ecosystem. And so lots of people have voices. So part of the work is community engagement and community engagement done well is hard. So I would say those are some of the, the challenges. Money is always an issue. And you know that we have an unconstitutional funding model in Ohio and it disproportionately impacts um, in a, in a bad way, um, urban school districts. So yes. being able to finance the supports needed to uh, make sure that there's equity in access to opportunity is a real challenge. Okay, so a lot to unpack. I wanna go back to your point because literally we, um, on, a, on a previous episode, uh, Chris Schmidt from the National Association of Manufacturers talked about this very thing, is how important it is to have direct experience in manufacturing as you, you know, climb the corporate ladder, quote unquote. Um, I think you hit it head on. There are a ton of people, including at the tippity top 
of the education scale of people who have no direct experience and ha should have no say in these important issues. And I wouldn't say that they should have no say, but it's to what extent um, can oh, I, folks I mean, be involved? I'll even take it further that I just, to your point, like there are people that shouldn't be in the seats. And I don't understand, and I don't want to, I mean, we can go down a rabbit hole. It's the whole point, right? Um, I don't understand how they got there, but I do think your, your point about politics and money taking over, and, it, and it'll, it'll transition into our next question too. It, and it's I'd like to give you an example though. Yes. So the Cleveland School District is going through a master planning phase, which um, the coronavirus has not made it easy for us to be able to and when I say us, because I still feel very much a part of the Cleveland School District, um, those, are, those are, you know, that's a family. Um, I think that there was lots of community engagement that was necessary, essential, and absolutely the right thing to do. People had mixed feelings. I think the district's approach was spot on, and I was really proud to see how they um, engaged the community and trying to really break down complex school finance topics in a way that was digestible. And I got to tell you that, that that's a feat if you're able to do that. But the truth is the school district needs to consolidate and close some buildings. And I'm, I'm not saying close schools in that you should have fewer teachers or fewer staff per pupil. Um, I'm not arguing that, but in terms of building infrastructure, it's just too expensive to maintain all of the buildings that the district has given the enrollment. Uh, you yeah. just can't afford it. So tough choices have to be made. In my observation, um, and I obviously when they were rolling this out, I wasn't, I'm a stakeholder of the Cleveland School District, but I was not working in the district. But my observation of kind of the community folks involved was that there was like, you know, you can cut that school, but not mine. And there wasn't like a whole, a holistic mindset from the community around why the district had to make some difficult decisions. And I understand, you know, the rationale and the reasons behind that. But the fact is, the district is going to have to, in the very near future, make difficult decisions. And we need to support the staff who are executing on those, even if the decisions aren't comfortable. Yep, yep, this, it's a perfect segue. So um, US education has dropped in world rankings since 1990 um, for a lot of reasons, but I, I would, uh, you know, a broad statement is saying mostly in part due to cuts in spending. Um, what are some of the major changes? And we can focus on Cleveland if, if you know, we don't need to, <laughs> it's a, a complex issue. Um, what are some of the major changes needed in the education space and strategy in the future? So for Cleveland specifically, one which is actually non-school district controlled is lead poisoning. Mm. If we do not eradicate lead poisoning from the city of Cleveland, I don't know how we're going to achieve the goals we want to see um, in K-12. Awesome. So lead poisoning is like, you know, everyone needs to stop what they're doing and make that the number one priority. I'm like, I'm shocked that we're not in a state of emergency. It's a very serious problem. There's no like medical intervention for lead poisoning. So once you're lead poisoned, you're lead poisoned. And there's been studies that lead poisoning and there's a correlation between lead poisoning and incarceration. It impacts brain development, particularly in young children, which means that they're going to struggle in school to no fault of their own. They are being poisoned. And so Cleveland is not the only community that has a lead poisoning problem. I would argue like, you know, Flint, Michigan, uh, you know, made the national news. Other communities have lead poisoning problems and they just haven't, um, had the media attack them yet, but lead poisoning is a critical issue. And this is because I'm, I, I did not know about this, so um, forgive me, but it, this is because of how old the buildings are, I'm assuming? So there's, I mean, lead poisoning can come in more than one way. So part yeah. of, in like Flint, Michigan, the lead poisoning was like, it was in the water. 
Yeah, so, that, that's where I, my mind went is the buildings were old and the pipes weren't right. That's where my mind went. So in Cleveland, I think it's less of an issue of like what's in the water. Um, we also have um, a sewer district that does a pretty good job of like making sure that our water is like purified. Nice. So I think we have less of a water quality issue, even though I'm not saying that we don't have any issues, but it's less perverse than it would be like relative to Michi uh, Flint, Michigan. Got it. It's really like lead paint. And because we have so many homes built before like 1970, yeah. when most of these homes were built, you have like lead paint chips like becoming like dust. And so you're breathing in lead. And that is what's causing some of the poisoning. So it's, it's a lead paint issue. So we've got to be able to eradicate that. And there is a lead safe coalition um, that is doing some work. Um, I participate in the workforce committee of that group and there's other subcommittees and lots of folks are involved. So we're directionally correct in having um, a community-wide effort to deal with lead poisoning. I would argue that we need a much more significant investment in dealing with this issue beyond what's currently been fundraised for. So if, if we want to do anything around education, like addressing lead poisoning is going to solve a number of issues um, and it's not something that the district can control. Obviously the district is aware of it because they do lead testing for uh, children who are in like pre-k and kindergarten but we're still having children test positive for lead poisoning in certain parts of the community. So it's like a it's a serious issue and many homes have you know, gotten rid of lead paint. So like, you know, I live in Shaker Heights. We don't have a lead paint issue, even though we have a lot of older homes because it's been dealt with. But there's like a dollar sign attached to dealing with lead, lead paint. And so when you have an affordability issue and you have a lot of renters, so you think about the city of Cleveland, you have a lot of individuals who are renting uh, maybe two family homes, then who bears that cost? Yeah. And so, it's, it's not an easy uh, problem to resolve, but it is a crucial one. I would say that, so that's number one. Then investments in early childhood and childcare. Um, and I think about childcare, it's such a complex policy issue. So I'm fascinated by it and also disturbed by the lack of quality childcare. So we have a ch child um, childcare quality issue in terms of like staffing and talent. We also have a talent pipeline issue. So the individuals going into that field, part of it is you need more education for low wages. So it's one of the lowest paid industries in the state of Ohio. So one, you have to deal with compensation and you have to make sure that those individuals are, you have a pipeline of individuals who are being trained. You have a facilities issue. So there's an infrastructure element to it. Um, and the other reason why it's so important from a, like a workforce development standpoint is that it's also a work support. So if you want people to go to work, you have to have uh, robust childcare options in your community. And so, you know, depending on where you live, the options are either not quality or not available. Um, and so we have to raise the standards. We have to provide support so that people can meet those standards. We have to have a compensation conversation so that we can draw more people into the field. And all of that requires like different policy levers and different actors. So it's a com another complex issue, but it's definitely one that we need to focus on. Poverty and hunger, so childhood hunger in um, many communities, urban communities, I know in particular Cleveland, but Cleveland's not the only one. A lot of urban communities have a hunger issue. And yep. so it's hard for children to learn when they're hungry. Now that should seem obvious to everyone. Like, you know, when you're hungry, can you focus at work? Like when you're thinking about lunch, you are not paying attention to what's going on or you're, you're, caught, you're already like on to the next. Like I'm thinking about, you know, having lunch and planning that. It's the same thing with kids, except worse. Like kids need um, nutrition to be able to learn. Yep. And then the last thing I would say uh, in terms of uh, changes for education is having a STEM focus. Hmm. So STEM exposure in middle school. 
and STEM exposure to like, I'm talking about careers. Mm -hmm. So like you can have project-based learning. I think young people need to see themselves in different industries. And we can contrast like the difference between healthcare and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. In healthcare, you know what a doctor does because you go to the doctor. So you see what a doctor is doing. But in manufacturing, a good number of manufacturing facilities are not necessarily like your neighborhood, uh, you know, healthcare center. Um, you're not getting a shot there. So it's just like a big building and it's what's happening inside is invisible to the public. And yeah. so you actually, it's hard to picture yourself working in that kind of industry if you don't have exposure to it and you don't see how what you're learning connects to that work. And that exposure really needs to happen in middle school, like way earlier than high school. We yeah. need to begin exposing children to those options mm -hmm. so that when they are in school and they're learning math for, you know, IT or manufacturing or construction or any of, or engineering, they understand why that math has value in their career. Yeah. Um, so I would say that having a STEM career emphasis early on is one of the major changes needed to education strategy. Got it. Okay, so to put that in a summary, there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> that yeah. is for sure. Um, well, let's let's uh, jump into towards employment. Tell us more about your role and responsibilities as the uh, ma senior manager of policy and strategic initiatives. Um, what are some of the major ones that you guys are focusing on for 21? All right. Well, one, I get to talk to people like you, so that's fun. <laughs> Um, I think of myself as like a, you know, an expensive cheerleader for the organization. Got it. Um, so I'm like always, you know, everyone knows I work for Towards Employment. Um, but okay. my role specifically is uh, focused on policy and advocacy um, and special projects. So on the policy and advocacy side, because about two thirds of the individuals we serve on any given year um, have some sort of interaction with the criminal justice system, we have a heavy reentry policy agenda. So we are focused on legislation that removes barriers to employment for those with records. So that could be focused on fair hiring, uh, which often people call it ban the box. I prefer to call it moving the box because everyone has to do a background check. So like you're never going to be able to avoid the background check process. Sure. It's just being able to share your experience before someone judges you by your past, mm. uh, which is important. Um, decriminalization of um, drug possession offenses. There's a bill in the state house now, Senate Bill 3, that would reclassify um, F4, F5 drug possession offenses as misdemeanors. Okay. The bill is currently not retroactive, which is a problem. Um, and I don't know if anyone's been paying attention to this election cycle, but there's been a number of states that have either legalized marijuana, decriminalized um, marijuana, um, and have restored voting rights. So there's a movement towards, you know, creating more um, policy that is uh, inclusive and supportive of individuals returning. Um, but I would argue that like Ohio has a has a ways to go before we're we're there, and um, as someone who works in workforce, I also want to be clear that legalization and decriminalization does not like change the fact that when you work in certain industries, particularly manufacturing and construction, you really need to not have any active addiction or an active use sure. because it's dangerous, not just for. Um, you know, whether or not you pick up an addiction, but when you're working in um, an industry with lots of heavy machinery, sobriety is really important. So just to call that out. So I support decriminalization and legalization, but there's also a rationale between uh, for why certain industries are stricter than others. Sure. For sure. So that would be part of our agenda. We're active with the National Skills Coalition. So we have some funding to think about supportive service policy in the state of Ohio from the National Skills Coalition. And this is an organization that convenes uh, workforce development organizations like Towards Employment, community colleges, businesses, um, workforce development boards together to think through skills policy. It's a nonpartisan organization. And uh, so at the federal level, um, I will engage with the National Skills Coalition. At the state level, we also have some engagement with them around workforce. 
Um, and then in terms of special projects, um, I'm the lead in my organization for thinking through racial equity and how we embed that. We have hired some consultants, uh, the Equius group, uh, to be able to help us think through um, some of our racial equity um, ideas and how we operationalize them. We're also doing some work with uh, PwC. Um, they're helping us with some of our diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, so the REI work that takes up um, some time. And then we are building out an alumni network. So that is thinking through how we better engage those we have served in the past, either re-engaging them or developing programming that they would benefit from. And the, the guiding principle behind the alumni network is really how do we have a continuum of social capital development when we think about what are the elements of economic well-being, and it really is making sure that people are employed, social capital, and then opportunities to learn. Those are like the three pillars, and Towards Employment does two of them really well, and so this third arm around social capital is where we want to beef up. And then I also represent our organization in a number of different um, community initiatives. Uh, so I, um, I sit on NOACA, which is our regional planning organization. I sit on one of their community advisory councils. Um, I do some work with P16, which is a network of provide nonprofit organizations that support Slavic Village. Um, I sit on the Greater Cleveland Reentry Leadership Coalition. I co-chair their advocacy committee. So I represent the organization and I find ways where we can add value as an organization to these different initiatives. And I think that's, that's mostly my job. Okay. Yeah. So you're busy. Um, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Um, I want to specifically talk about the last eight months and how yeah. strategy initiatives, programs, focus points have, have shifted for obvious reasons. Um, what has the eight months, the, you know, whatever you call it, eight, nine months been like um, for all the people that you're working with? So I think initially it was really difficult because most of our programs were in person. Mm -hmm. And so we had to transition to offering virtual programming. And so one like transitioning to an, a virtual platform that would work for our staff and making sure that our staff knew how to use it. Uh, another element was the digital divide. So many of our participants, um, so those we serve, relied on the public library system to access computers. Well, you know, right during kind of the shutdown in March, many of the libraries um, closed their in-person programming. Yeah. And so the resource that many individuals we serve use to be able to do job search or participate in um, uh, doing, you know, cover letters or mock interviews, that infrastructure wasn't in place. And so we had to figure out a way to deploy kind of hardware and devices to individuals and figuring out like a way to um, loan them out. So kind of having like a device library, but then figuring out how to get them back. Um, I was listening to a city club, um, a pop, like one of the city club uh, lunch, lunch and learns with uh, CEO Eric Gordon from the Cleveland School District and they've been deploying devices to families. And he's just like, you know, we're deploying devices, but we're not getting them back. Like, what are we gonna do? Like knock on $40,000, 40,000 homes and say, hey, please give this device back. Like that, that's not happening. So we had to figure out like, we're loaning out devices. How do we get them back? How do we make sure that individuals can get the tools that they need while, you know, being socially distant? So having to resolve all those things. I think that we've overcome a lot. We've learned a lot and there's probably some strategies in our virtual programming that we might even carry forward into, you know, uh, 2021, regardless of the pandemic. So even when, you know, kind of the, we go back to in-person programming, we might even have some hybrid options. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we've been able to adjust, but it took a little while. And we are currently recruiting for two programs. One around manufacturing. So we have some in-demand programming with, you know, employers at the forefront and designing, um, designing the curriculum. Uh, we're recruiting for that and also Step Up to UH, which is a program and partnership we have with University Hospital. And we work with individuals to um, connect to careers at UH. We have jobs set aside 
And so individuals connect to those first line jobs. And then we support individuals to um, pursue um, internal career pathways. And then once we do that, we backfill jobs that they leave to advance um, with individuals from the community. Um, and so we're, and we're specifically working with residents in Cleveland. That's awesome. Um, perfect transition. I want to talk, dive into uh, the work advanced training model and, and really get into what makes that so effective uh, for the community that you work with. I would say the linchpin of work advance um, is career coaching. Okay. We, and we differentiate between case management and career coaching. So yeah. career coaching is really um, helping individuals think through what their career plan is. And so we do career exploration, we develop a career plan, and where you start is not where you end up. So you might start in what our executive director would call an on-ramp job. So an on-ramp job may not be the job you want to end up in, but it's one that will, you know, pay some bills while you are um, in technical training. And so you might be in technical training for, you know, three months, four months, six months, maybe a year. Once you complete, then you are moving on to your next opportunity and you have your career coach who's helping you all along the way. And I think that's the differentiator is that career coaching is about long-term engagement. There's a focus on advancement and relationship building, but it's wholly focused on how you work that career plan of yours, knowing that. Uh, where you begin is not where you want to end up. In case management, we focus on barrier removal, and that's really at the front end of our programming. So you might come in, and you might be kind of in an emergency situation where it's like, I need a job now. Well, you know, we can help you get that job. So we call it an on-ramp position. And we might need to help you with childcare. You might have some legal issues you need to resolve. You know, people might have warrants out for their arrest, or they have some civil issues that need, um, need support. And we actually have legal services that uh, directly support our, the individuals we serve. So it's not like general counsel to the organization. Uh, it's general counsel to, to those we serve. So it's like free legal services. Um, and so we have, we might be resolving some of those issues, bus passes. Um, you might need to work on um, battling addiction. We serve quite a few individuals where they identify addiction as a barrier to employment. So we have someone um, who is working with those individuals to make sure that they connect to the right set of services. That's all in case management. And so once we can get, we get you into a stable place, we can really help, think you, help you think through your career. And that's where the career coach comes in. And the reason why we have the both functions in the organization is because you could have a time when a case manager needs to come in and provide some supportive services or some barrier removal. COVID's a perfect example. Individuals that we had placed in jobs who were doing well, they might have lost their job due to uh, COVID-19. And now they've come back to us, they might be in an emergency situation where they need supportive services. And so we have to come in, a case manager might come in and provide some additional supports. But that's the, the beauty of work advance is that you're blending lots of different services, the right service at the right time, all with a focus on advancement. Got it, okay. Um, I wanna transition a bit to one of the more commonly discussed uh, data points is the unemployment rate itself. However, uh, the labor force participation, participation rate is actually, um, in our opinion, an overlooked data point. Um, as of August, it stands at 61.7%, uh, according to the Borough of Labor Statistics. What can we do from a policy standpoint to, enc to encourage this type of participation again? Because we've seemed to hit our peak around 67% at the turn of the 21st century. In your opinion, what from a policy standpoint, can we do? So it's such a great question and I'm not a huge fan of and like the employment numbers mm -hmm. because I know that it doesn't take into cons consideration um, the long-term unemployed or discouraged workers. Yep. So it, it, the unemployment rate really just captures those who don't have a job but are actively looking. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also individuals that have what I call unreported income strategies. And some of those strategies are more or less legal. Um, on the 
the side that is more legal. I mean, I hate to call it like bartering and trading, but you have individuals who provide, um, you know, services in their community, in their neighborhood through, you know, family, relatives, relationships that they have. Um, and so those individuals who were doing real work and providing real value in our economy, that data is not being captured. Um, so uh, it's a great question that you're asking because the un unemployment rate is, is misleading. So whenever you hear somebody say, oh, we have such a low unemployment rate, and I'm like, mm, I mean, we have a low number of individuals actively looking. Um, but if you look at our labor force participation rate, then it's like, wait, we actually are missing quite a few people who could be working. Yeah. Um, in terms of policy, and I think when policy could be like small p policy, whether it's, you know, organizational decision making or legislative policy. And I think some of this lives in the like the former where we're thinking about like organizational policy mm -hmm. um what we need to do to increase labor force participation rates I, i'd say there's a couple things one genuine community relationships we should be relying on the individuals who know residents the best to be able to communicate and articulate what career options are available so, you know, you really want person to person, neighbor to neighbor um, contacts. When towards employment, when we think about how people learn about our services, the most, it's most often cited as word of mouth. That is how people learn, are learning about towards employment in our programming. So genuine community relationships and those will, the folks that are making those connections should also be paid. So we should not expect that labor to be free. Um, that is a, an essential role in the ecosystem that not only do we not have enough of, but part of the problem is that there's no compensation tied to it. So we need to fix that. Another is that we need to accept that not everyone wants a trades career. And so manufacturing has to have a reckoning about how they connect with individuals in what is the value proposition for the individual to work in trades not everyone wants to do it and so and we can't just have part of the reason why lots of folks use manufacturing is because it's low barrier to entry in terms of like if you have a criminal record so there's very few barriers to work in manufacturing other than like a maybe a couple federal pol uh, federal policies so if you're a manufacturer that has a federal contract depending on that contract there might be um, a barrier but for the most part low barrier to entry and technical training is shorter to work in manufacturing than it is to, let's say, become an engineer, which requires like a four-year, you know, master's degree. Sure. We also need to destigmatize um, that career. So making sure, and this is where it gets to the middle school exposure, yep. making sure that young people know that this is a viable option. And I focus on manufacturing because in Northeast Ohio, and actually all over the country, you know, makers are the ones driving our economy. So if you think about the Midwest, like the Midwest is like farming and manufacturing. And so we have to really have a full conversation on how we make um, that industry sustainable with mm -hmm. a talent pipeline, because even though it's becoming increasingly digital, when you think about advanced manufacturing, you still need someone working the machine. Yep. And so we definitely have to be able to build that talent pipeline. Uh, from a policy standpoint in terms of legislation, and I think this could be either small p organizational de decision making um, or legislation. I'd prefer legislation, but that's not always politically popular. And the conversation would be around job quality. That means uh, paid family leave, better scheduling, higher wages. Got it. Those are scary conversations for some people because when we think about like raising the minimum wage, uh, a living wage in Northeast Ohio is like $16 an hour. Well, minimum wage in Ohio is like eight twelve or eight ten. Yep. So we got to fix that um, because right now people are not making living wages. They yep. shouldn't have to work two jobs to be able to provide for their families. Yep. So job quality can be legislated. Um, and companies can just make decisions that embed job quality. And you'll always hear, you know, employers say, 
the most important thing I need right now is soft skills. And I can speak more to my feelings on soft skills in a, in a minute. Um, and I'm like, no, you don't. You need someone with like, you know, real skills. Like if you're working, um, if you're a welder, like you actually need to know how to do that. <laughs> and part of their issue around soft skills is just like, I need someone to show up on time. Well, if you live in an urban community that where there's been a disinvestment in public transportation because we don't fund that at the state level and you want to be able to um, make sure that individuals, you know, can get to your, let's say, plant, which you've located in a community that is far from the individuals who are willing to work for your wages, then we've got an issue. And then you wonder why a divide attendance issue or a tardiness issue. Well, one way that you can do that is, you know, micro transit solutions. Have you considered instead of like paid parking, a micro transit solution to make sure that your workers in certain communities can actually get to your plant? Or have you considered just locating in an urban community so that people have, you know, less travel? To access. Yep. So I think there's a responsibility of employers to account for what barriers people have that are just a function of like, I don't necessarily have the professional behavior determined by the dominant culture. Yep. So I'm not saying that's the right behavior. I'm saying it's behavior determined by the dominant culture. Um, what role do employers have in helping people meet those expectations? Because right now the expectations I'd argue are unreasonable. Yep. So that, again, we could legislate that. And then um, technical training, um, but not technical training that, you know, we have so many free programs, but it's not actually free. There is a cost to being in a no cost program. It's called not being paid because while you're in a program, while you're learning all day, you're not working. There's a trade-off. There's a cost to it. The cost is your time. And we need to value people's time and their decision to use their human capital or their intellectual capital to be in the workforce. And if someone is training to earn or training to um, be in a particular industry that you know, we need to have a strong talent pipeline, we need, to make, we need to have a dollar sign on that so that families can survive while they're in that training. So you can call it earn and learn, pay to learn, apprenticeship, like whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Paid work experiences, like, you know, there's all sorts of terminology we can use. Either way, we need to make sure that people can pay their bills while they are learning to be a part of the talent pipeline. And so I think those are some clear things that um, need to happen if we um, want to be able to increase uh, labor force participation rates. And that is separate from you know, digital access, which that's a whole another conversation. You could do an entire podcast on the digital divide. Yep. Um, the distinctions between soft skills, professional skills, and technical skills, and I'd say that's arguably not public policy. Those, those are sector, sector decisions. Um, On-ramp jobs, which some people call bad jobs, um, I would say are jobs that have less job quality, lower wages. Um, and there's a role for them in the ecosystem, but how can those jobs be married with technical training um, so that individuals can work and learn at the same time? But that also means that there has to be um, plan turnover and um, a cleaner scheduling so that individuals can do both. And so again, organizational decision-making, and we have to figure out how to deploy learning in a virtual environment because, you know, this may not be the last pandemic we have. Mm -hmm. And so adaptations for how you scale rapid reskilling um, is another, another big challenge. That's, that's a whole nother podcast. It sure is. And actually you might want to follow up. There's um, an initiative right now called the X prize and it's the future of work grand challenge and new profit is the organization that is kind of like organizing this national competition. And so in a, like, you know, maybe six months to a year, there's going to be a number of tested ideas around the future of work and they're very, they're focused on rapid reskilling. So Got that's it. something that people might want to look into. Got it. Okay. Um, 
Well, look, I want, first off, that was uh, amazing. I have a, a distinct feeling that you're going to be our first recurring guest. We're probably going to need to have you on again <laughs> to talk through. Uh, I'd love that. Or in detail about everything that we just uh, talked through, but we, we didn't get into the digital divide. We didn't really get into um, the rapid reskilling. So I, I actually do want to probably have you on again, maybe in a month, a couple of weeks and, and just do a little, um, kind of uh, overview of what we talked about and then continue talking about other important topics. But before we get you out of here, um, we talked a lot about politics and legislation and uh, policies. Are we going to be able to vote for you soon? Are you running for anything soon? Or are you staying out of it? <laughs> so um, I am not running for anything soon. Um, I'm always looking for ways to add value and play my role in the ecosystem. And, you know, I'm 32, so I'm still trying to figure out what my role in the ecosystem is, where I, I can and be the most helpful. So if I'm called to serve, um, I'll certainly be open to it. Um, but I don't actually have political ambition. So in other words, I'm not interested in being a career politician. So I'm interested in helping residents in greater Cleveland participate in our economy in such a way that they don't need to work two to three jobs to make ends meet. Um, and that we stop criminalizing poverty. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of ways to accomplish that. Politics and being an elected official or working in public service as an administrator are all pathways to being able to resolve that issue, but they're not the only ones. So I'm open to exploring any and all pathways to solve for those problems. Um, but I don't personally have like political ambition, but yeah. it's not like it hasn't, I haven't been asked before, so I always I, I have to think about it. All right, um, all right. Well, we'll we'll end on a, a fun one. Uh, we always like to highlight some Cleveland restaurants or local businesses, um, and this can go one of two ways. You can we you know what is your favorite restaurant in Cleveland? That can be one. Or since COVID, maybe what is your favorite um, you know carry out uh, or delivery restaurant um, since March? Oh up man. Um, or you can do both. Up to you. Yeah, because I don't have just one. Um, yeah, you can do multiple. That's fine. So, like, my favorite, like, carryout restaurant, which prior to the pandemic, I, like, definitely ate in, um, Saffron Patch. I love Indian food. Okay. Um, right. Places that, like, I would frequent prior to the pandemic would be um, the Fairmount um, Felice Urban Cafe mm -hmm. um, and Unbar, which is new. Felice and Unbar both on Larchmere, which is near Shaker Square. Okay. And Unbar is like a non-alcoholic non kind of neighborhood, kind of healthy food, ice cream kind of place. Very but cool. they have, uh, it's almost like a coffee shop with like healthy food options. And I, it's a place where I see a lot of residents just going to either work, connect. Um, so I love the community that is around Unbar. And I kind of feel the same way about Felice. Hmm. Um, so... Yeah, those four, the Fairmount, Felice, Unbar, and then Saffron Patch are my, my favorite spots. Awesome. Love it. Well, again, Bashar, thank you so much for today. This was uh, fascinating. And, and again, I think we're going to have to have you on in a couple of weeks to, to continue talking through okay. all, yeah, all the topics that we talked about today. Um, but thank you again. You know, um, I know everyone is stressed, so hopefully uh, we will know the results of the election here soon. Um, and we'll get through 2020 and, and head into 21, I think, with smiles to, to get through this year. But thank you again. We appreciate it. And uh, yes, we will talk with you soon. All right. Great. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Rust Belt Rundown. Make sure you check us out at rustbeltrecruiting.com. The Rust Belt Rundown is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and click on five stars if you enjoyed this episode. See you next time.